Good evening to one and all. It is my pleasure this evening to welcome Professor Noah Feldman. Uh, Professor Feldman is Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law, Chairman of the Society of Fellows, and Founding Director of the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law, all here at Harvard University. He specializes in constitutional studies with particular emphasis on power and ethics, design of innovative governance solutions, law and religion, and the history of legal ideas. A policy and public affairs columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, Feldman also writes for the New York Review of Books and was a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine for nearly a decade. He hosts the Deep Background Podcast, an interview show that explores the historical, scientific, legal, and cultural contexts behind the biggest news stories in the, in the world going on. Through his consultancy, Ethical Compass, Feldman advises clients like Facebook and eBay on how to improve ethical decision-making by creating and implementing new governance solutions. In this capacity, he conceived and architected the Facebook Oversight Board and continues to advise the company on ethics and governance issues. Feldman is the author of 10 books, including two textbooks, and his latest title, To Be a Jew Today, A New Guide to God, Israel, and the Jewish People was released just a month ago on March 5th, and that is the subject of this evening's talk. I want to thank Marty Linsky, Professor Marty Linsky, uh, who is a personal teacher and mentor of mine, of mine for sponsoring this evening's program. Uh, Noah, it is always wonderful to have you back. You've been such a dear friend of Harvard Hill, a place where you grew up, uh, and you were there just a couple months ago to celebrate your parents, Roy and Penny, there. 60th wedding anniversary. They returned to Harvard Hillel. So Roy and Penny, if you're watching, I want to wish you a mazel tov. Well, congratulations again. And Noah, I really want to thank you for writing uh, such what I think is such an important book, um, a kind of guide to what it means to be a Jew today. And I want to invite you just uh, to begin, kind of reflect on some of the main themes of the book. Uh, thank you so much, Donnie. I'm really honored and pleased to, to be here. The book is so connected to Harvard Hillel that it's even dedicated to the memory of Rabbi Ben Sion Gold, who presided at uh, my parents' wedding that was those 60 years ago and was my sunduk, uh, held me at my bris, um, uh, and uh, was a very important person in my life. And his spirit, I think, for me, really infuses the the approach that I that I take in the book. So let me say just a word or two about what I think it does mean to be a Jew today, just to, to frame our conversation. I would say that the core component for me in the book is the part where I describe the Jewish people as a very large, very loving, and sometimes, unfortunately, a bit dysfunctional family. And that description for me captures a lot about what being Jewish feels like, because families are where we have our first experiences of love. And love is a central component of Jewishness, God's love for the children of Israel, the love of the children of Israel for God, their love for one another as commanded by God, and their love for the other, for the stranger, as also commanded by God. But the kind of love that the Bible has in mind and the Jewish tradition has in mind when it speaks about love is a kind of love that combines that experiential familial love of the good kind with another part of love. And that is the fact that families are also often where we have our first experience of struggle or wrestling with others or uh, the difficulties that come out of love. And so Jewish love includes that too. And so the love and the struggle come together. And I try to illustrate that in the book by talking about a question that the rabbis uh, also were very interested in, namely the question of why the Bible starts with Genesis instead of starting with the Jewish national story or the Israelite national story in Exodus. This is also a good question for, for Passover. You know, it's a good uh, conversation starter. And actually the Haggadah is also interested in this question, uh, whether you should begin the story of um, in the beginning, our forefathers were idolaters. That takes you all the way back to the beginning of the story to Abraham. Uh, 
or whether you should start with the question of the exodus from, from Egypt. And the rabbis were actually have two minds about that question. And so we have both in the Haggadah. Well, one of the most fascinating features of the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, uh, and uh, the other figures of this uh, of the of the Genesis stories is that they're all family stories. And they're all family stories that feature intense love. And they're all family stories that feature intense, intense struggle. Struggle sometimes between Abraham and Sarah, Sarah and Hagar. Um, once you get to the Isaac generation, the desperate struggle between he and uh, Rebecca's children, Jacob and Esau, with one parent favoring each. The struggles in the next generation that give us the Joseph saga. These are intense stories of families that have serious commitment to each other and serious problems. And so for me, the archetypal story uh, that helps explain what it is to be a Jew is the story in which Jacob wrestles for a whole night with a being whom the Bible sometimes describes as an angel, sometimes as a man, sometimes as a god, and sometimes as God, with a capital G. So I won't resolve the question of, of what this being was, because I don't think the Bible resolves it. But at the end of this struggle, famously, as everybody on this call knows, this being um, is compelled by Jacob to bless Jacob. And he blesses Jacob with this extraordinary blessing of saying, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but rather Israel, because you have wrestled or struggled with gods and with men, uh, which is often translated, you have prevailed. But for me, the idea that we prevail in our struggle against God seems implausible. I prefer to read it a little bit more literally. It's from the Hebrew word, yachol, to be able. So I would say, vatuchal should be read as, and you were able. You struggled with gods and with men, and you were able. And to me, that is what makes Israel Israel, and Israel therefore literally means to struggle with or alongside God. And so for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet here and, and we can start having a conversation about it, the essence of what it is to be a Jew now and always, no matter what kind of a Jew you are, whether you're a traditionalist Jew, whether you're what I call an evolutionist Jew or a progressive Jew or a godless Jew, you're always struggling in love alongside other Jews with the divine or your idea of the divine. And the very uh, Rabbi Gold part of my message, also very Harvard Hillel, is that if you're doing those things, then you are being a good Jew. That is the essence of what it is to be a Jew. And they're all different. And it's possible to disagree about the right way to be a Jew and to disagree about many, many things as a Jew. And in fact, that's part of what it is to be Jewish. But everyone who's doing that is participating in the same underlying undertaking of what it is to be a Jew. And to me, that's a message that I hope would be true and valuable anytime. But in the aftermath of October 7 and the extraordinary struggles that the Jewish people are now facing collectively and globally, and sometimes with one another, it seems especially important to emphasize that we're all in our way trying to be Jews in the best way we can, even if we disagree really profoundly sometimes about what that best way is. So I think I understand this notion of struggle as being at the core, um, but I was a little bit surprised that there's so much focus in your introductory remarks and also in the book, the focus on God. Right. So often I think we think of Judaism as being able to contain atheism. People often ask, you know, there's been a decline in the Jewish population at Harvard. And that's certainly true. But one of the challenges is that the kind of best data we have comes from the Crimson, the Harvard newspaper, which when it asks people about their religious identity, it has being Jewish and being atheist as mutually exclusive, which I think for many of us, we understand that's, of course, an absurd notion. So. I'm curious why you center God and belief so much in the book. And even just, you know, quoting from your introduction, you write that I'm encouraging you, meaning the reader, to figure out what you believe, not by asking where you belong, but rather by asking what you think. And from there, seeing what kind of belonging might appeal to you. I think for many of us, we probably think more sociologically, kind of what's the community I'm a part of? And maybe then there's a God idea component there, and maybe not, but you kind of reverse the direction there. So why? 
Let me answer that in, in two related ways. The first is to say that I do talk a lot about God, it's in the title, and there's a whole section of the book that talks about it. But by God, I don't necessarily mean a literalist belief in a personal deity who supervises the behavior and actions of all humans, because many Jews today don't have that image of the divine, and many Jews in history have not had that notion of the divine. I mean, however, the spiritual component of life factors or functions for you, including deep atheism, which I tend to think of as the most Jewish struggle with God of all. I mean, to be absolutely sure and convinced that there is no God, you have to really be invested in, in that God who doesn't exist. And that seems to me extremely Jewish. But also the agnosticism that so many of us experience at different points in our lives, where you're genuinely unsure of what it means to say that there is spiritual experience, or what it means to say that there's a divine, or whether there is some order, or whether there is some possibility of eventual improvement in our in our world and in our lives. So I'm, I'm including all of those things within God, and I, and I try very much to do that in the book. But that still raises the question of why not talk about the groups we belong to? And this I really did on purpose, because I came to believe that there's, I have come to believe that there's something inadequate about a view of Jewishness that never asks us what we believe, but just asks us whether where we show up. I mean, I think we came there for a good reason. We came there because we want to be inclusive Jews and we don't want to send anyone away at the door of the synagogue or the Jewish community center, or for that matter, the kosher deli or the non-kosher uh, deli, just because they have the wrong beliefs. And that's a really good desire. And I, and I share that desire. But we do have to ask ourselves, why are you Jewish? Why be a Jew? For me, I picked the title to be a Jew to suggest the kind of Hamlet other side of that. You know, there's to be, and there's also not to be. And I don't accept the idea that you have to be a Jew because the world handed you Jewishness and you can't walk away from it. That's just not true in our era. You know, at one time, perhaps you could say with Jean-Paul Sartre that the, the anti-Semite makes the Jew. But first of all, that's not a very historically Jewish way of thinking about it. And Sartre indeed was not a Jew. And second, it doesn't correspond to our reality. You know, our kids, my kids are going off to, to college soon enough, my, my son next year and my daughter, you know, God willing, the year, the year after that. If they choose to walk away from being Jewish, they, they could do it. I don't think it would be so difficult for them to do. And I think that's true of a lot of people. So to me, the affirmative answer to why be a Jew ought to have some relationship to the spiritual side of our existence, because I want an affirmative reason to be Jewish. And the fact that you belong to a group, it might make you feel good, in which case, great, that's a good reason to belong to the group. But then why that group? Why is that group special? Why is the group of the Jews different from any of the other many groups that we belong to, whether national or cultural or political or what have you? And to me, that answer has to be a deeper, richer, and more complex answer. And I'm calling that answer God, but it doesn't have to be a literal kind of a God. And often at different times in my life, for me, sometimes it has been, and sometimes it hasn't been. So can you sort of unpack how you would answer that question of why be Jewish? I mean, you're saying it's God, it's struggling with God, but can you try and give that a little more contours? Yeah, I, I definitely would like to try. And in a sense, that's sort of the, the reason I, I wrote the whole book. For me, why, the answer to why be Jewish is that you're drawn in some deep way to a vision of spiritual and the divine that is really parallel to the kind of love and profound connection that we actually experience in the real world, in which our loves of human beings are completely inextricable with our occasional difficult struggles with those same human beings who we love. Now, I, I want to quickly note that this is not a good marketing strategy. You know, I mean, there's a reason that Jews make up, you know, 15 or 16 million people in, in the world and that you've got almost 2 billion Christians and almost the same number of Muslims and a billion or more Buddhists and, and so forth and so on. All of those worldviews think you can make things a lot simpler than I'm describing them as being. You know, you if you're a Christian, you accept God's love, you embrace God's love, it embraces you. And it's supposed to be pretty unproblematic in that way. You know, if you're a Muslim, you accept God's authority and his justice and his judgment and his mercy. And that's all there is to it. It's not a complex picture. 
And if you're a Buddhist, you practice a kind of loving non-attachment that itself is very clean. And it's also not a coincidence that these three traditions, they have exemplars of people who got it all right. You know, I mean, that's the picture of, of Jesus as a true God man. And it's the tr picture of the prophet Muhammad as a, a perfect man in a lot of strands of Islam. And it's a picture of, you know, the Buddha as someone who really achieved this incredible, uh, this incredible state. And what do we have? You know, we have Moses who's enraged sometimes with the people of Israel and sometimes with God and is fighting with his sisters and has a complex personal life. You know, we've got King David, who's um, a hero in every imaginable way, except in his personal life, where, you know, his favorite wife turns out to be someone whose husband he had to dispose of on the front lines of, of a war, and on and on and on and on. So to me, to be Jewish is to say, I want a way of encountering the divine and the spiritual that matches what I experience in love and in connection in the real world. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's the most appealing deal in the world. I think it's objectively speaking not, but I am saying it resonates for some people. And we call the people for whom that picture resonates Jews. And they're people for whom this kind of experience of the divine doesn't, doesn't necessarily come easy. And I'm someone like that. Um, uh, we're going to continue our conversation, but I do want to remind our audience that you'll have a chance to ask your questions to Professor Feldman. To do so, you can take a look at that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, click on that, submit a question by name, not anonymously. And if we select your question, we often have many, many questions, and we'll invite you later to uh, become a panelist. You can turn your audio and video and ask your question. Please only ask a question uh, in the chat, in the Q&A, if you're prepared to come on uh, and speak to Noah. Uh, so Noah, you, you spend a lot of ink in the book talking about Israel. It's a whole section of the book. Um, in your mind, what are some essential ways uh, that Judaism kind of pre-state is continuous with Judaism post-state? Uh, and in what ways has the creation existence of Israel kind of radically altered what Judaism is? Thanks very much for that question. Let me try to answer it by starting with the the primary aspiration of the radically secular classical Zionists. Their aspiration was really to replace the category of Jewishness with a new category, the category of Israeliness or belonging to Jewishness as a nation rather than as a religious faith or an ethnicity. And that was a really radical aspiration. And it was because in their secularist view of the world, they thought that Jewishness experienced as a religion or as a faith or as a set of cultures had really not served the Jews well because it was associated with being in the diaspora and being oppressed and being kind of neurotically stuck in a you know repetition compulsion of thanking God when things were good and blaming God when things went badly. And they thought that the answer to that, the solution to that, was to actually do stuff, you know, actually go to a place, settle it, have an army, become a become a nation, and in that sense, become a nation like all the other nations. And that was the kind of aspiration to change Jewishness from a special, unusual status one that they associated with religious belief, but also with oppression, into a much more normal status, like other nationalism. So in that sense, Zionism aspired to be a nationalism, like all other nationalisms. Now, part of the Zionists' dream was achieved in that Israel did actually come into existence by their actions. You know, they actually did it. They made a nation state. It's kind of extraordinary. I mean, it's very extraordinary by almost any standard. And in so doing, they created a nation, but that nation didn't turn out to be a nation of all Jews. It turned out to be a nation of Israelis. And we know that because Israelis today speak their own language, modern Israeli Hebrew, and they have their own culture. Um, they Many serve in the Israeli military. Um, if you meet an Israeli, you know, and you're not an Israeli, you're American or you're British or what have you and Jewish, you know immediately that you're not an Israeli and they're not the same thing that you are. And indeed, there are some Israelis, a lot of Israelis, a couple million, more than two million Israelis, who aren't even Jewish at all, who are who are mostly of, not all, but mostly of, of Palestinian ethnic or national identification. So, and I'm talking about citizens of the state of Israel. So then if the 
classical Zionist ideal wasn't exactly realized, something really strange and interesting also happened. And that is Israel and the nationalism that became Zionism ended up infusing Jewishness. Instead of replacing Jewishness, it became a part of Jewishness. And in this way, Israel has come over the last 30 or 40 years for many, many, many Jews of very different kinds of backgrounds and perspectives to be their answer to the question, why be Jewish? What um, the late, uh, very great professor, uh, Rabbi Isidore Tversky, who was my teacher, used to refer to as meta halacha. Professor Tversky meant by meta halacha, not what is the law within Jewishness, but why should I follow the law? And I'm borrowing that idea to frame this question of why be Jewish? And so for some secular Jews, the answer is I'm Jewish because I care about the state of Israel and I support the state of Israel. For some, um, let's call them religious Zionist Jews, Israel gives the answer to the question of how God's unfolding salvation of the Jewish people is going to occur. And Israel is a state that is either in the, the birth pangs of the messianic redemption or somewhere along that process or that they hope will take on that process. And for them, they can interpret the entirety of Jewish life and experience through this messianic vision as manifest in the real world state of Israel and its real world experiences. It's a little trickier for two other groups of Jews. Um, for Haredi or, or traditionalist Jews, very frequently Haredi Jews will not say that they are Zionists, but increasingly many Haredim have come to identify with the state of Israel. More and more Haredim speak good modern Israeli Hebrew, even if they don't live in Israel. They identify sometimes with political parties in the state, especially to the right. They identify with the government of Israel, and they even identify with the same military in which, for the most part, they don't want to be drafted and, and don't want to serve. And so for them, too, in a way, even without calling themselves Zionists, Israel is becoming part of their reason for being Jewish. And then there are the great majority of American Jews, whom I call progressive American Jews, in the religious sense of that term, and that's most reform and most conservative and most reconstructionist Jews. And for, for those Jews, in the course of the 70s, 80s, 90s, Israel became one of two pillars, I argue in the book, of the core of Jewish theology, including for people who would say, I'm not so sure I believe in God. One is support for Israel, and the other is commemoration of the Holocaust. And those, I think, are the core elements, and they coexist alongside the belief that at a spiritual level, Judaism is the practice of social justice, of tikkun olam, repairing the world, and of uh, effectively expressing one's Jewish values in the prophetic way via um, clothing the naked and feeding the hungry. So for those Jews, Israel can be completely compatible with their progressive social values, provided the actually existing state of Israel is a liberal democracy. And I think for a lot of progressive Jews, especially of, of my generation and older, that has felt like a very unproblematic conclusion for a long time. But for a younger generation of Jews, say the Gen Z Jews, you know, people my kids age and the age of kids in college today, who are deeply believing in Judaism as um, social justice, they see it as a lot harder to identify the actually existing state of Israel with their social, socially liberal and liberal democratic values. And so for some of them, that's become a real challenge, even a crisis. And so for them, some of their criticisms of Israel, I argue, are actually coming from a Jewish place for them. For them, it's about the their felt sense of the incompatibility of thinking of Jewishness as demand of tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, you know, justice, justice shalt thou pursue with their the commitment to Israel with which they were raised. And so for some of them, that leads to ambivalence. For some, it's distant identification with Israel. For some, it's outright criticism of Israel, and for some, it's rejection of Israel. And so I think that's one of the explanations for the generational struggle that we see among progressive Jews today. So I've got questions on both of those last two groups. So let's start with what you were just concluding with the progressive Jews. Uh, if that trend continues, that progressive Jews, uh, I guess, specifically in America, become uh, sort of less connected to Israel, do you think that that community can still sustain itself? Um, and kind of how do you sort of see things playing out over the next you know, generation or so? 
Well, the first thing I would say is that for the Gen Z folks, they're not failing to relate to Israel. They're not really, you know, walking away from Israel. They're just turning to Israel with frustration, criticism, and, and sometimes anger and rejection. So that is a form of relating to Israel, much in the way that, in my view, you know, an atheist certainty that there is no God is a way of relating to the non-existent God. Um, it's a sign of commitment and connection and preoccupation, even if it is a commitment, connection, and preoccupation expressed primarily through the negative or even exclusively through the negative. But I, if you ask me more broadly, can progressive Jewish life continue without Israel as one of the core elements of its, you know, its theology without a theology? I think the answer is yes. So, and I'll say that in two ways. For one thing, the, the orthodox critique of reform Judaism as it will never last is exactly as old as reform Judaism. And that's now coming up on 200 years. And that critique, um, you know, it has something in common with the old joke that every generation of Jews has in common with every previous generation that it's completely confident that it is the last generation. Um, here, it's not an internal worry. It's primarily, it's an external critique. And I think that critique is very unconvincing. Um, and it's empirically unconvincing because progressive Judaism not only remains, but remains numerically in the United States, at least, by far the most popular version of Judaism, although orthodoxy is, is catching up primarily because of birth rates. So that's the first point. It's the staying power of progressive Judaism. The second is that progressive Judaism came to Zionism relatively later than some of the other strands of Judaism. You know, the, the Pittsburgh platform, which is from more than 100 years ago, but is you know, it was one of the key statements of belief by the Reform Jewish community in the United States, has the words in it, America is our Zion. I can't get much more explicit than that. And then it, it took a long time for the Reform movement first to accept that it was appropriate to support Israel, and then eventually to make the support of Israel into a central component of it itself. But progressive Judaism has a lot of emotional, spiritual, and other resources available to it that aren't specifically related to Israel. I would add just one more footnote to that, which is that it's one of the quirky things about institutional progressive Judaism, let's say institutional reform Judaism, that it's highly rationalistic. And it's not very interested in what you might call new age spiritualities, which of course are also the same as the ancient spiritualities. You know, if you go into most reform temples, so relatively rare to hear from the pulpit, a rabbi speaking about angels as though the rabbi, as though she believes in angels, um, or perhaps that she does believe in angels, or emphasizing that we're now going to sing a song to the angels in a more than metaphoric way. But actually, if you think of the most popular form of spirituality in America today, for all people, Jews or non-Jews, it's precisely a spirituality that's deeply interested in re-enchanting the world, that believes in angels, that believes in divine intervention, that wants to meditate, that wants to have mystical experience, that maybe wants to use psychedelics as a tool to get you there. These are mainstream trends today in global religion, and especially in the United States. And the Jewish tradition has, through the Kabbalah and through popular beliefs in the enchanted universe, enormous resources to do this. And although it hasn't happened yet, I predict that within a generation, many people in the reform movement younger people will turn to these resources. And the way I would put it is to say this, in the 19th century in, in Germany and when it started, and maybe in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, when it reached its kind of peak, Reform Judaism needed to look to the rationalist tradition in Judaism so that Judaism would seem up to date and would survive. And luckily, Judaism has an incredibly rich rational strand. And so there it was. Today, in order to survive and flourish and save Judaism, in fact, what is needed is a turn to the mystical, magical, angelic strands of Judaism. And it turns out those are every bit as powerful and every bit as central as are the rationalist ones. And they're there as resources as well. And we see this a little bit in the kind of Jewish, in Jewish renewal circles. But I think it's really, really an important thing. And it's it's going to be growing enormously. You know, we, when we sing Shalom Aleichem and on Friday night, and most Jews of whatever stripes are happy to do that, there's two ways to sing that. You can sing it never thinking about the fact that you're actually talking to angels, or maybe thinking that metaphorically you're welcoming the Sabbath in an angelic way. 
or you can actually think you're talking to angels. And if you do it that way, you're suddenly deeply connected to the most powerful trends in contemporary American spirituality. So since I think a lot of people care about Judaism and want to save it, I think we will see a turn in that direction that's already beginning at sort of the periphery, becoming more mainstream. It's interesting, I teach a class, text-based class to our community online on Wednesdays, and I sent out a survey at the beginning of the semester and included in that list was about the role of potentially psychedelics in religious experience. Um, that actually was not so highly rated, so I haven't considered teaching it, but Maybe after your comment here, I can send out that survey again. Well, maybe, Donnie, you can start with the, the angels, and then from there, you can see where it leads. Sounds good. Um, I do want to get to um, the Haredi community, but before I do so, following up on what you just said, I may have missed it, but in your book, I don't think there was such an emphasis on uh, Jewish education. And uh, my sense, um, you know, in reading the book, you yourself have a rich Jewish educational background, deep familiarity with classical Jewish texts, being able to read them in their original with Jewish rituals. Um, and so I'm curious how much you think that is essential to living uh, a Jewish life. Again, you can understand education in a couple of different ways, but I think uh, the textual education and familiarity with Jewish traditional Jewish practice. What I would say is, if you look at the long sweep of Jewishness over say 2000 years, you can actually see a big range of different answers to that question. And it's actually really characteristic really of the last 50 or 60 years to have a strong ideology that claims that in order for Jewish life to continue, all Jews must be able to have a pretty sophisticated capacity to read Jewish texts in the original. So let me first, you know, out myself, you already outed me. For me, that is my Jewishness. And the kinds of encounters that one can have with Jewish texts, both intellectually and spiritually, through reading them and reading them in the original, for me is essential to who I am as a Jew. And, and it's a big and, I do not believe that that is necessary to a fully realized Jewish life. So think, for example, of the Hasidic masters who were living in a world where the great majority, as was the case for most of the last 2000 years, the great majority of Jews did not have sophisticated text reading abilities. Many could barely make their way through the prayer book, some not even that. And the Hasidic masters developed, drawing on Jewish traditions, a full spiritual way of being driven by song and dance and the concept of, of dveikus or dveikut, clinging uh, or cleaving to God, none of which on their account required deep or really any textual engagement or knowledge, and yet which was still for them fully and authentically Jewish. Sure, they believed very firmly that Jews should follow the laws, and so you have to know the laws, but you don't have to be an expert in them. You have experts and, and rabbis for that. So that's an example of a form of Jewishness, very influential, by the way, on, on Rabbi Gold, um, that is self-consciously anti-elitist and self-consciously thinks that an, an over-focus on the technical expertise that is required to read Jewish texts, and it's required even if you're a native Hebrew speaker. You see this in modern Israel. You could be a native Hebrew speaker and you would still need years of experience to read these texts. It's not like the language of modern Hebrew is the, is the magic, you know, the magic key to, to open these texts. You need the time and the work and the technical expertise. That can all be seen in that tradition as very much overvalued. And I think if you look in historical terms, there have always been an elite of trained people, mostly rabbis, though not all, who devoted their lives to the study of those texts. And have always seen that as central to Jewishness. But in many eras, they didn't try to extend that to everybody, maybe because it wasn't realistic, but also maybe because, of course, the aspiration to Torah was always there in the Jewish tradition. But the aspiration to Torah doesn't necessarily mean an aspiration for everybody to be educated at, at a rabbi-like level. So I'm moved by that vision of Jewishness, where which aims for that. And that was the kind of Jewishness that I grew out of. You know, the Orthodox Jewish day school movement, the goal was graduate everybody, boy or girl at 18 years old, able to sit down and not only read Talmud, but really 
go deeper into the commentaries and, and be able to do something with it. And I'm incredible. I can't even express my gratitude to the teachers who devoted their lives to enable me to have that. And then to my teachers, you know, at Harvard and, and at Oxford, who helped me deepen my knowledge of, of Jewish texts and sources in, in, in very profound for me ways. But I don't think that it's necessary for everybody to have that experience. Um, and I don't think it ever has been for, for Jews. Hmm. So turning to a community where that really is the aspiration, the Haredi community, or as you describe the traditionalist community, at least for men in that community. Yeah, so you, um, that's an important, important caveat. It's an aspiration for half the community. I, um, I'm, one thing that really surprised me and felt novel in your book is the description of sort of how that community has shifted in its relationship to Zionism, whether that's in a kind of uh, explicitly stated way or more so even in an unstated way. And I'd love for you to kind of outline that for our audience. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, to look at it from the outside, you'd think the Haredi world is as far from identification with Israel as it has ever been. And if you look at Israel right now, there's some possibility that the Netanyahu government will fall over the question of the drafting of Haredi. I, I would predict in this audience of people who are very sophisticated about Israeli politics that it actually will not fall. Um, too many people have too strong an interest for it not to. I think we're seeing the the Kabuki theater associated with a run-up to an intense compromise. But there is some chance of it happening. And I heard a political commentator, a smart one, say recently, look, it's not that it's definitely going to happen or even that it's probably going to happen, but it's more likely to fall over this than any other thing, which is pretty remarkable considering, you know, the political um, waves that the Netanyahu government has had to had to go through both during the judicial reform before October 7 and, and then the substantial public, Israeli public, um, disapproval of Netanyahu's handling of the war. So that's on the surface. But underneath, look at the reasons and arguments that the Haredi community gives today for why they won't go and serve in the army. The argument used to be, it is a waste of time and a waste of time that should be spent on Torah, Beetle Torah, to serve in the army. And then the argument was also made that the army is this powerful secularizing force. And so we shouldn't have to go, go into it. Now, the predominant external argument being made by the Haredi community is that by studying Torah full time, the Haredim are serving as soldiers to save the state of Israel by spiritual means. And you hear this rhetorically if you, you know, watch the news or listen to interviews or look at it, look it on social media. You'll hear Haredim saying, um, I am a combat soldier for the Torah. I, I actually read an account by one Haredi who said, when soldiers are killed, I feel awful because it means that I didn't learn well enough. Because if they died, it was because God allowed them to die as punishment for the fact that we were not doing our job of providing the spiritual protection for the IDF that we achieve by our learning. Now, notice that that's a really different justification. To say that is to say, we're just as committed to the safety of the Jewish people as the secular Israelis are. Our labor is just as important. We are combat soldiers in our own way. Now, if you're a secular-minded person or even a religiously-minded person who thinks that that's not how God does things, you know, um, God demands that you have a weapon to defend yourself. God doesn't just rely on prayer, um, either of those views. You're going to be very skeptical of this argument. You're going to say, oh, that can't be right. And you're going to say they can't possibly mean it. But you have to remember that the people we're talking about are people who belong to a community where belief in God is near universal. And it's a genuine, sincere belief in a God who is an active, present, personal figure in the world. And for folks like that, when they say our acts of study and religious commitment are preserving the nation, they, they mean it. And they don't mean it metaphorically. So that represents a position that is actually identified with the state and says that what they're doing for Torah is on the same side of the state. And it would have been unimaginable to hear the argument framed in those terms by Haredi Jews who were not Zionists 40 or 50 or 60 or 75 years ago. So I'm going to use that as just a, a way to capture the change. But you also see it, you know, if you talk to many people on, on this Zoom, we'll, we'll know Haredi and we'll have Haredi family. And if you talk to them about Israel, you know, they have a politics with regard to Israel. They have commitments with regard to Israel. They care about what happens there. 
they would reject the idea that they don't care about those things. They just wouldn't embrace the label Zionist. So they're, they've become what I would call non-Zionist Zionists in a certain respect. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Reminder to our audience, we'll have a few minutes for your questions uh, in just a bit. So if you'd like to submit a question, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type in your question by name, not anonymously. And if we select your question, we'll invite you to ask your question to Professor Feldman directly. I've got a couple more for you. And one is kind of Thanks. a very broad question, which is, um, you know, how do you think October 7th will change or has already changed and continue to change what it means to be Jewish? Certainly there's very clear political consequences within Israel, but I'm thinking more broadly what it means to be Jewish, both in, in within Israel, in America, kind of the whole gamut. So the first thing I want to say is that I, I don't think that a horrific tragedy like the events of October 7, you know, the, the unspeakable um, act of, of terror that, that took place and the people who died and the people who were taken hostage on its own can transform in some fundamental way what it means to be Jewish permanently. Nor, I don't think, can Israel's response um, in Gaza with you know more than 32,000 people on the Palestinian side of an uncertain number of how many are combatants and non-combatants, but I think most people, including Israelis, acknowledge that the, the overwhelming majority of those are non-combatants. I don't think that will fundamentally change what it means to be Jewish either. And the reason is, um, for Jews, the suffering and the martyrdom of Jews is not a new thing. You know, the Holocaust happened in historical terms a relatively short time ago. And although the attack of October 7 is unprecedented within Israel with respect to the number of civilians who were killed, that's a question of the number of people who died under particular conditions, not a question of struggling with the core question of how could it have happened from a theological or a spiritual or religious perspective that Jews, innocent Jews died in this way. And, you know, similarly in the other direction, the number of Palestinians who's die, who have died is, um, it's unprecedented for Palestinian civilian deaths, certainly in the post-1948 period, and depending on how you measure, I think probably with respect to 1948 as well. Um, but Israel has previously been in wars fighting against Arab states and against Palestinians, and a meaningful number of civilians have died as, um, you know, as collateral damage and sometimes as, as subjects of direct killing in, in those wars. So even though we're overwhelmed psychologically, emotionally, and affectively by these events, and we are, and I am too, and even though it's the case that we experience these events, especially October 7, partly through the lens of our intergenerational trauma, that is, we see these events partly through the lens of the Holocaust and through the lens of pogroms, and indeed through the whole lens of you know, the long durée of Jewish history, then that's all real and intensely experienced and intensely felt. And it's important to acknowledge that. These aren't problems that we haven't encountered before. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, you know, how we react to these kinds of challenges goes to the core of our spirituality. You know, for anyone who thinks, oh, well, you know, you can talk about Jewishness without spirituality. Hard, hard to talk about the Holocaust without some spiritual question of what does it mean? It may lead you to think there is no God. It may lead, lead you to think that there is a God who acts inscrutably. For traditionalist Jews, it would lead you to think what traditionalist Jews have always said, which is that when Jews are, are killed, we should ask ourselves, like we do on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, what did we do wrong? You know, what are our sins? Not because we can always answer it, but because our goal is to try to improve our, our conduct. And I think the same is true for the exercise of force by the state of Israel. Um, again, this is not something that Jews really dealt with in an extensive way until 1948, but Jews have been dealing with it since 1948. What does it mean for there to be a Jewish state that operates like any other state in the sense that it has a military, it engages in military action, and is part of that military action of self-defense, it also kills people. But that's part of how that, that goes. I do think that there's a generational question of how Gen Z Jews will experience their Jewishness in their adult lives when the formative experience of their engagement with Jewishness was 
a combination of October 7 and the Gaza war in its aftermath. And that's why I think the reactions that young Jews are having, whether they're strong solidarity with Israel and support for Israel, which many young Jews have, including not only um, Orthodox or traditional uh, Jews, but lots of others too, then those experiences will turn out to be defining and definitional. And also the experiences of those young Jews who are feeling alienated from Israel or critical of Israel may well turn out to be definitional. So I think, you know, over the next 30 or 40 years or 50 years, as those those kids grow up and become Jews, their experience of being Jewish is going to be inflected in part through this defining set of experiences. And that's real. And those are going to have to ask themselves, why am I a Jew? Why do I want to be a Jew? And I hope that they'll find in their moral reactions, whether those are strong support for Israel or, or something else, reasons to continue to be Jewish. Um, because I think, and I'll just put my cards on the table here, I think it's really valuable for the Jewish community to have young Jews who love and care about their Jewishness, who are struggling with the hard questions of what is the right way to be a Jew and how should I think about my relationship to Israel? Because I think that for that generation and maybe for every generation, those questions are questions that deserve struggle. Those are valuable and important questions. Uh, I've got one final question for you, and then we'll turn to our audience. And it's a personal question. Um, when I was in touch with your mother as you were writing the book, she said she had seen an early copy, and she said that she was moved. And so I was curious. I wonder what you know Noah has written that was moving. Obviously, she's your mother, but I too was moved. I think it's a very personal, uh, in a certain way, you know, appropriately so, a certain kind of intimate. Uh, book and I'm curious for you sort of the choice to write that way and what that experience was like to write to such a large audience about something in such a personal way that's a great and very very thoughtful thoughtful question I, it is a very personal book in which my emotions are on the page and that was true you know when I was drafting it you know for the last three years so long before October 7 and it was a process because when I first started writing it it was starting to come out sort of like my other nine books, you know, pretty analytic, um, talking about emotions to say that people have emotions and these are some of the emotions they might have, but kind of hiding myself a little bit behind the, the call it the shield of being analytic. And the more I wrote it, the harder it was for me to sustain that shield. Part of this was um, the influence of my, my fiance, Julie Allison, who was always telling me, well, that's great and it's interesting, but if you're going to tell people why they should care or maybe why they shouldn't care about something, I think they'll naturally want to know, why do you care? And then that made me realize, well, look, I am writing this book. And so I think I owe the reader some answer to the question of why I care. And I would like to try to reveal that in some way. And so it comes back to that question of, of why be Jewish. And I don't think that anyone's answer to that question can really be specified in some purely rational analytic fashion. It's just not possible. Our Judaism is a Judaism of love and of struggle. So it's a Judaism of emotions. It's also a Judaism of reason and logic. But I would defy anyone, you know, other than perhaps the great Moses Maimonides, who thought he could do this because he was an epitome of Aristotelian rationalism, to answer the question, why am I Jewish, by saying, well, let me give you some axioms. And then from those axioms, I'll derive theorems and conclusions. And then you'll know why you should be Jewish. I mean, I, I've never met anybody like that, ever. For everybody that I've ever met who's Jewish and who cares about being Jewish, there's a much richer set of emotional, very human experiences that include seeking after some meaning that's bigger than we are, whether that's in the community or whether it's in the spirit or whether it's in the family or in some very complica complicated combination of all of those things. And so that that forced me, that forced me to be more honest and direct and to come out from behind the protective shield. And I was really scared to do it. And um, it still feels a little scary to me even to say that. But then when I think about it, I think to myself, why? Why should I be afraid to say that part of being Jewish is emotional when the core of Jewish teaching is this teaching, um, as, I, as many of you heard Shai Held uh, speaking about his book about love uh, the other day, is, is a teaching of love. Love is an emotion. I mean, Maimonides tried to turn it into a pure form of rationality, but love is an emotion. God's love for the Jewish people is depicted in the Bible as profoundly emotional. 
we may abstractly think that God doesn't have a body and doesn't have emotions, but the God of the Bible, if you read the Bible, gets angry, is zealous, is jealous, has all kinds of emotions, and love is the predominant emotion. It's not always a healthy love, but it's a love. And so, you know, given that that is all the case, it seems to me we don't have to pretend that our Jewishness is all head and, and no heart. It isn't. I think it was a, a good choice and makes it a uh, more compelling uh, read. Uh, no, thank you for answering my questions. Uh, we do have a hard stop at eight o'clock. We're going to go to Jonathan Levy for first question. Uh, Jonathan is an alum of Harvard College. And I'm going to say that because of some past questions, we're going to be firm. Uh, you got to ask a question directly, succinctly. So Jonathan, thank you for coming. And uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Um, thanks very much, uh, Professor Feldman. I, too, have a great admiration for uh, Rabbi Gold. And like you, my parents uh, met through Harvard Hillel in the 1940s. My question is this. I agree with you completely that argumentation and controversy and disputation is kind of one of the core values and processes of Judaism. But in your view, are there any controversies or, or uh, uh, debates that might intra-Jewish debates that would fall under the heading of controversies in the words of Pirkei Avot, not for the sake of heaven? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a, I, I appreciate the, the sharing of the personal details and I, and I love the question. The, the fact that that Ethics of the Fathers does offer this categorization of debates for the sake of heaven and debates not for the sake of heaven does suggest that the tradition is willing to label some debates that way. The problem is, how would we know which ones they were? You know, the people's, it's similar to, you know, the, the teaching in the Talmud that the Second Temple was destroyed because of sinat chinam, you know, groundless hatred. Seems completely reasonable position to take and very very thoughtful and, and loving position to take. But surely the people who had those hates didn't think they were hating for no reason. People think they, they have reasons. And so I guess what I would say is before telling someone, you know what, we disagree, but your side is not for the sake of heaven. Mine is, but yours isn't. Or your hatred is grounds, but my hatred has reasons. I would call for some humility on that point. You know, I think I would rather say to people on the other side of something, look, we each care profoundly about this. And Judaism is not a relativistic tradition. I myself am not a relativist. I don't think we're both right. You know, like the old joke about the rabbi. You know, I don't think we're both right. That's right, too. Um, so we really disagree about something really important. I think I'm right. And I think you're wrong, profoundly wrong. But I do recognize that you're trying to answer that question from a Jewish place. And I can have respect for you in that dimension, even if I don't have respect for the content of your answer. So I'm not calling for a Jewishness where we all love each other so much that we agree. That, that would not be very Jewish at all. And it's not be very realistic. By saying that we're a family, I'm not saying we all get along. I mean, everyone who's ever had a family knows that having a family doesn't mean that you get along all the time. In fact, sometimes you're angrier at your family than you are at anybody else in the world. I am saying that you remember that the people on the other side, you should try to remember that they are your family and they're trying to. And if you can adopt that view, then maybe, maybe, maybe your disagreement can be the shame shamayin for the sake of heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining. We'll turn now to uh, Sherry Leffert. Uh, no, I'm guessing you know Sherry from the Worship and Study yes. Minion. I, I was just speaking um, at the Worship and Study Minion this past Shabbat, um, talking about Ben Gold. <laughs> so Sherry, please go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> I <laughs> I know <laughs> I didn't get to ask this question on Shabbat, so I, I have I was surprised that you lumped um, conservative Judaism with Reform Judaism. I think they have really distinct uh, outlooks. Um, uh, social justice is part of a conservative outlook, but it's not the key element so much as it is in Reform. So perhaps you could explain that. And my other question is: Would you reveal to us? where you stand on this spectrum of... Um, the, the first one is, which is a hard one, it's still easier than the second one, but I'll, I'll try both. <laughs> okay. um, so the first thing I would say is, I try really hard in the book not to spend almost any time on the sociological divisions of Orthodox, modern Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, conservative, reform, humanist, reconstructionist, Jewish renewal, because lots of other people have spent a lot of time on that socio those sociological issues. And I think we've made a mistake of starting by asking, 
where do I belong to? And then asking, what do I think? I want people to start with where they think. And so my three big categories are not based on the movements. To me, a traditionalist is anyone who believes God spoke at Sinai and gave authority to the rabbis and that binding authority binds us still. An evolutionist in my category is anyone who thinks there is a law that is binding and it comes from God, but human beings interpret that law and humans can actively participate mindfully, thoughtfully, and intentionally in taking that interpretation in a given direction. And a progressive Jew in my account is anyone who believes that the key of Jewishness is to interpret the tradition in light of correct morality and social justice. And that when the law deviates from that, we can set aside the law. So you could belong to any of these movements really and have views like that. And last but not least, godless Jews are Jews who I think in some way think that their Jewishness can be fully expressed without thinking about the category of the divine at all, whether they're agnostic or atheist or, or something else. With respect to where I stand, I'll tell you the truth, Sherry, which is which I say in the book. I, I, there's almost no view in this book, almost no view that I haven't held at some point in my life. And, you know, and you, if you wake me on some days, you can find me in a really Haredi, you know, traditionalist mode, saying that, you know, we can't pull it together without that. I was raised by evolutionists, and I find the evolutionist approach to be the most inspiring for its idealism and its desire to reconcile. I'm also, I, I resonate deeply with the progressive tradition. And, you know, also some days I'm completely godless and think that if, you know, we need God in this game, we're not going to be in it at all. So, I, and I think I'm not alone in not being able to say exactly where I fit in. And I think that's fine. That's my struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Matt. Thank you, Sherry. I know, I think the fact that you do find yourself in those different kind of places at different times is one of the things that makes the book so compelling. So I do want to recommend to our audience, go out, get this book, read it. Pesach, Passover is coming up. You can get it as a gift to bring to whoever's hosting you or a family member. Uh, and no, I just really want to thank you. Um, you've always been so kind and generous to Harvard Hillel. And we're very grateful to always have you and get a chance to learn from you. Often it's been in a very different way, but here something personal directly about Jewish life. Um, it, it's really inspiring. And I think we're very proud that you're someone who grew up in uh, in our community. And I also want to thank again, Marty Linsky, again, a personal teacher and mentor of mine for sponsoring this event. Thank you all so much uh, for joining. And no, I know you've got to run off. So um, I wish you uh, safe travels where you are and um, have a good evening and also a happy Pesach. Happy Pesach, happy Passover to everybody. And I just would say, want to say, I literally could not have written this book without Harvard Hillel. Um, just like I couldn't live the Jewish life that I do without Harvard Hillel. So I, I just want to express the, the depth of my gratitude. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good night, everyone.